coming in a moment on Art Rocks, a plein air painting competition that brings artists from all around the country to paint South Louisiana. A street musician who's discovered his perfect place in the sun, using art to connect with your cultural heritage. And LSU's textiles and design students going way high tech. That's all about to happen on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, your faithful correspondent from Country Roads Magazine. Today we're strung out all along Bayou Teche, that slow moving waterway that connects many of South Louisiana's earliest and most historically interesting settlements. One of those is New Iberia, where each spring artists from throughout the United States gather for the Shadows on the Teche plein air painting competition. Their subject, Acadiana's most beautiful outdoor places. Let's take a look. The Shadows on the Teche competition is about experiencing the Acadiana area and we are trying to promote plein air painting and plein air painting means painting in the open, it's a French term. We invite 30 artists every year that are juried in by a nationally known plein air artist and we give out awards and each artist can paint as many as they want but only two can be in the competition. We've had from Canada, and this year we've got New York, California, a lot of Wisconsin, Missouri, Florida. My name is Jordan Zozak. I'm from Southern California. I've been traveling the States for close to a year now, painting. I'm here to do the Shadows on the Tetch plein air competition. It's my first plein air competition. I had a friend who attended last year, and she attends a lot of different competitions, and she said this one in particular was a really fun one and so far it's been great. Food or landscape is a hard one. I've been enjoying both, but I think the landscape's been pretty surprisingly amazing. I had high expectations, but it's kind of blown them. It's been beautiful. People have been beyond welcoming, and it's totally different than everywhere I've been. I haven't spent that much time in kind of low country, and there's a different atmosphere, and uh, the trees look different, and the swamps and everything is just like, there's a cool, heaviness to the, the atmosphere, so it leads to interesting light, and I really like it. And there's also, I guess this time of year, the trees are kind of barren, so there's kind of this like eerie, a weird shape to the trees, like these like fingers sticking out of the sky. I um, spent the first few days I was in town driving around looking for noticeable things to paint, and this barn caught my eye. I like the kind of mundane, decay I don't it's not something maybe that would typically catch your eye painting and so I like these things that are not necessarily breathtaking views they're kind of more human and personal so I decided to stop on the road and paint it I painted some of the marshes and uh, I painted some donkeys the other day I'm trying to just get a little good variety so I can have an eclectic thing a collection to show the, the competition Susie Baker is a nationally known artist. She's on the board of the National um, Oil Painters of America. She's very accomplished. I do do events all around the country, but Louisiana is not that far from my home. I live north of Houston, Texas. My mom lived and taught in Lafayette, New Iberia for a while. So coming back to this event feels like coming home to the landscapes and the, the bayous and the cypress and the moss-covered oaks that I grew up with. I find the competition part of plein air painting to just be a lot of fun. Um, the people that participate in events like this tend to be very happy people. They're uh, not moody, they're doing what they love, they're out painting out of doors, getting their vitamin D. If you are an artist and you are wanting to paint, there is nothing that beats what your eye can see versus what a photograph can see. The eye has a range that a photograph does not. The scene that you see right now I've chosen because of the sugar mill in the distance, which is a sugar mill that's no longer in operation. And the Tesh in the foreground, I feel like it tells the story of Louisiana as a girl growing up 
I remember going to sugarcane festivals where they would grind the sugarcane into the syrup and boil it off and make the syrup and so it has um, some nostalgia for me but it also speaks to a time and a place in Louisiana. The sugar mill isn't operational anymore. I don't know how much longer it'll be here. So in some ways it's a historical painting and representation of Louisiana. I've been out to Avery Island and painted part of the rookery. I have painted live music at Vermilionville. That's probably the most fun I have painting. The music and the motivation and that painting is very wet into wet, a la prima, and responsive to that Louisiana music. Living away from Louisiana for so long, you come back to the place and that thing that you grew up with that felt ordinary and commonplace now has a nostalgia and it touches my heart. And so for the first time again, you see the moss-colored oak, you hear the music, and you also see it from the historical standpoint. You travel around the United States and realize that we are such a diverse nation of unique people. We have different views and scenes from the ocean to the prairie to the moss-covered oaks of Louisiana. My name is Phil Sandusky. I'm a landscape painter from New Orleans. I've uh, been painting in New Orleans since about 1984. I'm well known there for my cityscapes and also uh, landscape paintings in the region. And I work strictly from life. People from around here down in Cajun land, they sort of consider me to be an outlander. Imagine some of the artists from up north, they come down here, they've never seen a live oak tree. And it's amazing, you know, when you think about it. And we just kind of take those for granted. They're popping up out of the ground like weeds. I've chosen Abbeville. I'd never had seen it before. It's like so many small towns. It seems to be the downtown area seems to be waning a little bit. And there's a, there's a kind of a wistfulness about that. But I just think it's an incredibly beautiful town. What a jewel. So the architecture is beautiful. And of course, the people like everywhere in South Louisiana are incredibly friendly. Everyone is just a friend who walks up. So it's been great. I'm sure other people are, are having the same experience. And year after year, I look forward to exploring more of this area. This will probably be the fifth painting. This one I've been working on more than I usually do. I'm probably in my about my fourth hour, just haven't you know, done any of the little details. I have a few little things, little refinements and a drawbridge back there I've got to suggest. It's kind of interesting. I always do the cars and, and this stuff first because cars can drive away, you know, when you're doing cityscapes. I've done a really nice view of the drawbridge on the other side of the river, looking back with the steeple of the church and the bayou. Here they call it Vermilion Bayou. Down in Lafayette, it's called Vermilion River. I've got that in the foreground. I did another painting of just a, another street scene, but kind of a vacant street. Not like this, but with a lot of busy and vitality. And I did another painting of a statue in the foreground in the park with the church bell tower and steeple in the background with uh, tangled up uh, crepe myrtle limbs. In this competition, to me, art is really subjective. And so I don't really like the idea that some people win and some people lose and this and that, you know. But we're allowed to choose two of the many paintings that we've done, or the few paintings that we've done. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's difficult, just depending on it. if you've done a lot of work that's not as good as what you usually do, then you're, it's kind of a, like the lesser of evils. But if you've done a lot of strong ones, then you have to kind of figure it out. And I sort of ask people if I can. I, I don't mind asking people, well, what do you think of these, you know, and that kind of thing. At this time of year, we all need to get out and make the most, both of the weather and the bounty of events that make this time of year in Louisiana absolutely unique. Here's a bit of what's coming up this week in a town near you. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, keep your eyes peeled for a copy of Country Roads magazine.
And while we're at it, LPB's Art Rocks website features an archive of previous episodes, so to see any episode again, just log on to lpb.org. Doesn't matter whether we're talking about New Orleans or New York City, any place tourists gather you're likely to find buskers, those extroverted artists who turn street corners and town squares into impromptu stages. In Rochester, New York, one busker's unique performances have been stealing the hearts of passers-by. Check out what makes this guy stand out from the crowd. My name is Jackson Cavalier. I'm a street musician, otherwise known as a busker, I'm from Notch, New York. I'm a one-man band. I play uh, guitar, harmonica, I sing, and I also play a suitcase bass drum. I made out of Samsonite, a uh, suitcase from like the 60s, and a tambourine as well. During my busking sets, I mix in originals with covers. A lot of stuff is like old timey stuff from the 20s and 30s. You know, like St. James Infirmary Blues, um, Summertime. But then I'll also throw in some more contemporary stuff. I try to make it so everyone will know at least one song in my set. And... Busking and street performing is definitely kind of coming more into the public mainstream again. At Lilac Festival this year when I was busking, I saw probably about three times as many buskers as I have in the past couple years, which is really nice. It's great that more people are doing it and you know people are more interested in seeing stuff like that. I've been playing music since I was nine. I picked up the harmonica and I, uh, I just got one of those little you know, how to play harmonica books and started going into it. It's got such joy from it, how to play these little tunes. I really started playing when I was 12, and then a couple years after that, I started playing guitar and harmonica together. And then it took me until I was 19 to learn how to do the, uh, the whole one-man band thing with the drums as well, but I mean, I, I haven't gone back since. It's been amazing. I've grown more confident over the years, just knowing it, what types of people I can reach out to and really grab attention of. And I found, it, you know, overwhelmingly, it's, it's positive. I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. There was something so tender about that face. Even your most sad neck was so much. People of all ages, you know, will have some sort of appreciation for what I'm doing. Um, and I think it shows in, you know, the, the type of music I play. You know, I kind of go across the board and, and make it my own, and I think people appreciate that. I don't think I would ever stop busking, going out. It's just, it's too much fun, and nothing beats it. That make me crazy. That make you crazy. Probably just crazy. Plenty of Americans feel the impulse to explore their origins through genealogical research. One lesser known cultural group doing exactly that are the Basques, fiercely independent folk who trace their origins back to part of the Western Pyrenees that straddles the border between France and Spain. In the late 19th century, many Basques came to the United States and Mexico. One place that a community took hold was Reno, Nevada. And let's take a look at how Basque descendants there are working to preserve their history through works of art. 
The mission of the Sparks Museum is to protect and preserve uh, and educate the public on the history of Sparks in the Truckee Meadows. And so I think that the bass culture is so prevalent here. It was something that we wanted to bring to the museum so that the public could experience a more complete view of, of the bass people and sort of where that culture came from. Reno and, and Nevada, but Reno in particular is very much a, a Basque American place. We be in kind of the window of Basque art, Basque culture in general, and Basque scholarship. Basque art was an aspect of our uh, overall appreciation of, of, of Basque culture. Late 19th century, uh, Basque initially came for mining, etc. They are best known as sheep herders from the late 19th century, and that was an industry to which that quite a few Basques came. And there was kind of a demand for Basque sheep herders throughout the first, second part of the first part of the 20th century. So that's how kind of we are known here as sheep herders. So the main uh, art event here of Basque art is the monument to the Basque sheep herder that was installed in 1989 here at the Rancho San Rafael. And it's an expression of the combination of the, the best known Basque figure, the sheep herder, and Basque art. So it ties with the legacy that the Basque have left in the American West. It is very much an abstract culture and it's very much a modernist. Rather than having a, a dog or a sheep figuratively represented, you have kind of a, a some rather geometrical figure represented. It's a magnificent piece of art by, by Bastarrechea. We have another sculpture by him here at the library, uh, which is uh, called Orreaga or Roncesvalles which is uh, commemorating the historical victory of the Basque on Charlemagne. And it was a major kind of a, a Basque legendary event. You can recognize some of the figures that have to do with these mythical beings. And then um, images from nature, trees, or kind of uh, with a more abstract archetypal kind of figures. Center for Basque Studies. Began in the middle 1960s, it became sort of a main uh, repository of information on Basque, scholarship on Basque, and the main library collection outside of the Basque country. So it became significant to anybody uh, in the U.S., of course, but also in the whole Anglo world, in the global world. It became a reference for Basque studies. The Basque Center at UNR has been wonderful in helping us by lending artifacts and books uh, for us to display for the duration of the exhibit. The Basque Center was generous enough to lend their arbor glyph to us, and basically what it is is a tree carving. The sheep herders in their uh, loneliness they started leaving their names and references to where they were from and kind of the, the date when they were in the mountain. And then they also made some pictures of, of women and of other things. The Basques were very minimalist people. They don't have a lot of material possessions. So when you're really looking at the culture of a people, it's important to look at their art and the things that they left behind. So in the case of, say, the Arbor Glyphs, those are pieces of art that they made for themselves and for fellow sheep herders. So we're kind of getting an insight into their perspective. They didn't do it to be exhibited, so the sheep herder left it as kind of a testimony to their presence there. But in the process, they created some of these very nice figures of women and just worthy of their art in many ways. A major aspect of Basque cultural resistance to Francoism and to the repression of anything having to do with Basque identity and Basque legacy 
a major, major resistance was art. So in the 1950s, 60s, in the post-war period, there was a whole bunch of artists that became very relevant. They became sort of together with some writers and some anthropologists and kind of prominent figures like that. They became sort of the voice of the Basque legacy. So if we are representing here Basque world of culture, in a way art is unavoidable, that is a key part of what that legacy is. When it comes to technological achievements, it's hard to think of many more important to humanity than the invention of fabric. What's interesting, though, is how much that ancient technology continues to evolve. Here's Casey Stennard, design professor in LSU's Department of Textile and Apparel Design, to show us some new high-tech equipment that is changing the way we sew. We have a size stream 3D body scanner. We can actually use that to put a model inside and get measurements which are extremely accurate. And then using those measurements, we can actually draft patterns in our computer software to fit the model correctly. We also have some plotters, which are for printing out paper patterns so that the students, you know, when they're trying to make sure that the fit of their garment is correct, they can print out the paper pattern, cut it out of, you know, a cheap fabric, and then test the fit of their garment to make sure that everything that they've put together is looking good before they go into their more expensive fabric or the digital printed fabrics. We have a really nice printer here, which is a digital textile printer. It's a Mamaki TX3. And the students can actually design their very own fabrics using programs like Photoshop or Illustrator, and we can print them in-house. They're also having the option where they can do something called an engineered print, which is a print that is wrapping around the body and actually fits into the pattern pieces that they've made on the computer. Usually you're gonna use uh, Photoshop or Illustrator, kind of the two major programs that we're gonna use. Uh, you can bring in like photo photos and do actually photorealistic images. Um, you can draw your own things. It's really sort of what you would like to do on the computer in that digital environment. And once you have it layered up and looking the way that you actually want it, you save it just as like a TIFF file and we bring it over to the printer and we'll actually print it out on a pre-treated fabric. Then we actually have to put it into a steamer so that the print will set and then it's pretty much ready to go. And the piece behind me is actually a design that I did myself. Uh, I started out by draping it on a dress form and once I got the pattern where I wanted it, I digitized it into our computer software, cleaned it up, then I exported it into Photoshop and actually built a print into the pattern pieces so that it would be engineered to really you know, optimize how it was going to look on the body. And once I was pleased with that, I was actually able to print it on our uh, digital textile printer and of course sew it. This um, department is textiles, apparel design, and merchandising, and the students who are on the design side are in apparel design. We actually really start usually from the ground up. Most of our students come in without have our, having touched a sewing machine, so we have to teach them how to sew. We do that for a full year. We teach them also how to use computer illustration, and then we teach them how to make patterns, how to make computer patterns, how to do 3D draping on a dress form, so they get that three-dimensional aspect of design, and then they actually are creating fabrics along the way and then they do a collection for their senior year. We have a really nice fashion show. We have it every year over in the Student Union Ballroom. We usually have 350 to 400 people who attend and our juniors get to show their top three garments, so kind of the best things they've made so far. And our seniors will actually show their final collections, so they're usually four to seven garments. And we have all our own models, all our own music, and it's a true runway show. And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But remember, art lover, you can always watch episodes of the show at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if that's not enough for you, Country Roads Magazine is a great resource for enriching your cultural life with art, cuisine, escapes and events all across the state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thank you for watching. <laughs>